Well, let's kick things off, man. I, I look first off, glad to have you back. Glad to see your yeah. smiling face again. But uh, for anybody that doesn't know Ryan, why don't you give a little intro, man? Uh, yeah, I'm Ryan James, uh, president of uh, Surety Bank. We're located in uh, Central Florida, uh, a town called Deland. Um, I've been CEO since 2009, and uh, you know, a little community bank that has a little national presence and and some of our niche markets, and you know, uh, that's where we're at. Yeah, you guys kick some pretty good ass. Yeah, man. I, I, what was it? Are you like the the most profitable bank in Florida, or something funny? We're we're up there, yeah. yeah. Consist- consistency, yes. You know, over the last five ten years, we'd be up there. That's uh, awesome. We're consistent in the top five. You know, so, some will jump up, but uh, yeah, yeah, we've been consistent. And and um, in the ICBA, yeah, in the nation too. I think we we're like twelve last year out of community banks under half a billion or something. Yeah, I love it, man. Well, tell us what's been going on, man. What have you been up to? Right now, you know. I'm sitting back, kind of watching a little bit of the bass stuff. You know, the, uh, that's been uh, eating popcorn. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but it, it, you know, none of it is new. Like you knew that was going to happen, and it's just so ridiculous. Um, you know what's kind of going on there? Uh, yeah. it just how the banks didn't avoid it to begin with. With that aspect, I mean, it, it, it was simple. They couldn't freaking reconcile. Like. Yep. You yep. stop doing it when they can't reconcile years <laughs> ago and don't move the program. Yes. You know, it's just simple, you know, yeah. so they did away with the basics and, you know, yeah. got, it just got me thinking about, you know, the banks that are outsourced, like they had no idea how much they're outsourcing. They're outsourcing their own decision making. Yes. So, you know. Well, they, they've uh, What grabbed me, me and dad talked, shit, it was probably midnight last night. We were on the phone talking, right? And the thing that really grabs me is, they outsource their own authority. Yes. Which is your basis of safety and soundness. When you sit down and you say, I'm going to give somebody the keys to do everything over their network to God knows where, and they're going to be my source of truth. And the only answer that I really have from the bank standpoint is did everything balance to the So I don't know that I have a problem until I have a problem. And when there's a problem, it's because I've been robbed. That's not safe or sound. No, no, no. Yeah, if you came to me as a bank and said, "Hey, I got this great idea. I'm going to take 100 bucks from this guy and put 25 here, 75 there, and you really don't have any visibility as to what I'm doing." And trust me when I tell you that everything in my spreadsheet's correct. You'd laugh in my face, right? <laughs> but yet, and here's the crazy part: people aren't even. They're still not even hitting the tip of the iceberg of what the real problems are. There's other guys doing this. Oh yeah, I, we tested years ago with a fintech. And they couldn't reconcile six thousand dollars in fifteen accounts. So it was, but that was, you know, we didn't let them go past that. Like, yeah. no, you can't reconcile because they have no idea um, of card networks, their fees associated. They were all going to commingle it all in. You know, they they don't know that they're separate networks. So I guarantee you, every yeah. transaction and every fee that was ever charged in order for them to have a card network. Was they were just taking it right out of the kitty the whole time? I bet you. Yeah. Makes sense. And and you, you read an article reason. about Entrify, and it's like, hey, I could do that. <laughs> no, you can't. That sounds right. Yeah, so, it's a long time. Yeah, and and then now, of course, the you know the regulators are just you know scared mm-hmm. with all the banks that do have a source of you know integrity that won't let that happen. Right. You know, so oh, I mean, you, yeah, that's the, the deal, the, right? You, you go beat the yeah. hell out of the good guys because of a bad guy. Exactly. Yeah. So I want to ask you this, man. So I was thinking about this, and there's a right way to do this, there's a wrong way to do this. Damn sure the three of us know that. Um, but I think this problem brings a lot more into the fold, right? I mean, you got to think about FBO accounts, I think for a long time, it probably should have been a bigger topic. And who owns the FBO account, right? Who's the named party? Uh, Where's the liability live and all that? Um, But as this shakes out, you saw the note from Jelena basically firing off flares, help me, right? To everyone, help me. Yeah. Uh, But I mean, it feels like this is kind of like one of those landmark case precedent big deals, right? That 
it's going to outline how we all go forward from here in the future. I mean, I feel like all of sponsored banking is almost in question a little bit, right? I mean, you're going to have to make some changes or at least enforce some rules a little better than they have. I don't know. What do you think, man? Yeah, absolutely. But what about the rules already exist? It, it, it is common sense. It is concentrations. It is these things. So, I mean, if it's a deposit aggregator, if I was going to look at somebody, the deposit aggregator is, okay, great. You have a new little widget that you're selling on front end. You think you're going to have a, you know, what is it? What digital bank even makes it anyways? That is on. You know, there's a couple out there that have done well, but in general, we haven't seen their income either. So we don't even know that they've done well. But um, let's say they've got a better mousetrap on the front end. You know, where are you validating what they say they're doing is true? Um, so, I mean, first, the reconcilement is a non-issue. If they can't get that from day one, you don't go anywhere, but then you got to have limits. How far? I mean, I, I you know, I've, I don't want customers to be too big. I don't want to be dependent on one customer being 20%, 50% of my income. You know, I don't want to put myself in that position. So, you know, they put no guardrails to put themselves. So, they, uh, you know, let's say it's a success. Well, then... They just that success is going to be their downfall to begin with it, if it's a little bank. Yeah. And, you know, now they're using that liquidity and it could be gone overnight on something that you have no control over. So, I mean, yeah. it's, it's all basic sense to me going into that step. You know, how big can it be? So you just have your own concentration limits set on that. If you want to have it as a deposit gatherer, you know, great. But, you know. You maybe you don't want more than 10% of your total deposits out on that one customer, 5%, something. I mean, it's not out of line. It's no different than uh, real estate concentrations. Mm -hmm. you know, do you want to have everything in one, you know, sector? Do you want it all in commercial real estate? Yes, no. You know, I mean, just run. I'll tell you what. To me, it's just, a, it's such a great thing to have the opportunity to you know, do embedded finance or do vast banking and all that stuff. But you can't go to, just because... I show up and tell you I'm a quarterback. Doesn't mean the Cowboys are going to pick me up tomorrow without a tryout. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's really what we're talking about. The guy walks up and says, oh, yeah, I got the ledger. I got AML. I got KYC. I got EIEIO. We are all good to go here. And they're like, cool, turn them on. And let's roll. We didn't reconcile. No big deal. Let's keep going. Okay, what can happen? Now, here's the bad part. The the players, you know, the the connector guys, they're taking this person's money bringing it up here into them and they're going to different banks with it and then somebody's supposed to reconcile that that's impossible yeah and no, the regulator comes well. into this bank up here and says show me the money they don't even know where the money is because they don't know where everything is on that well, all right regulatory visibility stops at the bank and responsibility so who's supposed to handle this it should have never been done in the first place that's the point i've been making for a while of I think it's like everybody woke up and is focused on the ledger and the reconciliation, which good. Welcome to the party. Right. That's the start. But where the real problem is, is that all of these connectors, they're a network at the end of the day. Right. Yeah. Maybe they only have three or four sponsors or maybe it's many more, but they're a network and moving money amongst sponsors gets a little dicey. Oh, yeah. And it's really interesting because one of those banks on Synapse, uh, is also on Sync Terra as well as Synapse. So now you've got networks on networks, and the whole thing is poison, right? Ugh, this is nasty. So and then you we'll sweep the count overnight to really make it confusing, right? And who has the authority to sweep the money? Does it the fintech is where, connector? Is, is it every, the every yeah. banker misses this because in a normal situation with an RT or you know Enterprise, the banker has the relationship with the sweep guy. Okay. He's the customer, and here's the sweep account. And he says, okay, no sweat. I have everything ledgered for all my people. And these people get to say, I don't want that bank, or I want this rate, or whatever. Cool. All right. When you get to this connector model doing a sweep account, the connector is the actual end customer, and he doesn't have to go downstream and get permissions for anything. He's actually the customer, has a bank doing a sweep, but he's the one that owns the sweep account. <laughs> it's wild. So when you talk yep. about a network, listen, I've seen all of these. 
you know, over the years, I've seen the AML programs of a lot of these different companies, and I am just constantly blown away of what garbage still exists out there. And the first thing I do when one, if something like this hits us, you know, we look at true audits, like is there a third party validation? That's number one. But you just seek right in and, and review their AML policy. It mm -hmm. takes you 15 minutes right there to tell you if they know they have an idea of what they're doing on that side too. It doesn't take long. Yep. yep. It's a good call. If the it, answer is we have an API. Just yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but I mean, <laughs> uh, you've seen um, a lot of the fintechs, it, it'll have a customer facing in, but, but the majority of their backends are complete garbage. Mm -hmm. And it really, you, you think that on the front end, it, it's uh, that, but really they've got more human intervention in the back, moving these files back and forth that people that think they were reconciling. When right. we had that little FinTech, uh, the, the digital bank, they were actually trying to tell us that we were wrong on reconciling. When they were just looking at one side of ledger, they had no idea to take two separate reports to even look and see if they coincided. And then when, you know, so like the whole foundation of accounting, they don't get, they didn't get that mm -hmm. basic. So and then you want to rely on them building a ledger for millions with. Right on, man. Five. Right on. I can't yeah. get the grin off my face sometimes over this because yeah. I, I always say this to people. It's like banking is for experts, not yeah. some smart ass that's got well, money that they can spend and blow. That's and not and it. Most, most every time you talk to anybody, any fintech, they not only are real time, but they are adamant about how stupid we all are for not right. being time everything. Yeah. It's like by the time you get to the end of your journey, when your bankruptcy comes for you, Mr. Fintech, you'll realize why we batch some things over here so that we can reconcile, we can manage fraud on and on. There is some benefit. Speed is not always paramount when we're talking about risk, right? And it's a balancing act. Yeah, uh, and in those little keys on the reconciling that even and even though they could be twenty, thirty dollars, mm -hmm. I even look at those at our own bank and and cross over that not because of the twenty dollars, but because it could be a sign of something major, right? And, and it goes through. And we have over the years seen something a little small, and it'll be a hole that you didn't know or controls to put in on like bill pays or or things like that in your institution. That's a lot of avenues that you know fraud can be committed in different things, and so. You know, that, that reconciling is paramount, man. You know, if we're not reconciled, you know, I mean, we're daily, daily morning. I mean, I, I was just at a bank with a bunch of CEOs and we were talking about AI and we we're grouped off the size of banks. And, you know, I was amazed at what they were excited about AI. They were excited about, you know, front end marketing purposes. And I'm thinking, OK, great. You know, you'll just be with everyone else. You know, like you're not going to set yourself apart. I'm glad you're looking at that. And meanwhile, I'm thinking of AI. I'm like, I'm going to speed reconciliations. We're going to have processes in the background done quicker. I was the only one actually thinking about enhancing uh, operations. No. Operational efficiency. Yep. That's yeah. what I think we think the same way and everything, every application, everything that we've done, like almost everything has been on the back end. We both, yeah. I mean, we, we think data and backend, and I mean, sure, I don't know, we got a chat bot or something that like takes notes. That's and what they were excited about. about. Sure, but. Yeah. They were excited about the internal chat bots and that kind of stuff. And I'm thinking, oh my God, we've already got your continuity. They can put on there and type in this policy and it pops up. Damn. You know, if they can't do that, I don't want them as an employee. Like, let's move on and get them, you know, let's focus on what is really going to make us faster and less error. And, and I think knowledge base, too. I mean, the, look, to me, you can imagine, I mean, I, I wouldn't exactly call us big data because our data set is for our industry. It's massive. Right. Oh, but, but you better not, hope our guys don't hear you say that. OK, fair. It, it, it's <laughs> not for our industry. I'm just saying compared to like, you know, 70 years of the Internet. Right. It's not that big. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't take us more than a day to run a cycle. You know what I mean? Um, but as we're running things, we're able to go in there and specifically on ML, we can learn things and then stack rules. Right. And get through process and automate things that are really interesting. It gets super interesting because you're able to build essentially a knowledge base that then can look for things 
and identify things that this is this is my best part. Mm -hmm. We've been able to find things and answer questions that I wasn't smart enough to ask the question. Yeah, right. that's like yeah. right. The rest is to your point, man. It's like everybody's thinking about automation. How do I how do I make me go farther and faster? I'm like, I want to build something way freaking smarter than I am. You know, that's what I really want. That's the application. <laughs> if he if he lift his hair up, he's got a little port in the back. That's where yeah. you plug in. That my Ethernet port. What are the Texas bankers? Are you guys having any or uh, is it on your mind about credit unions buying banks? Oh, did you see the one a couple of days ago? But there was Florida? A, there uh, maybe it was a bank that 10 or so years ago changed to a credit union who's now changing back to a bank. Oh, um, that one. Well, that, well, we've got we've got um something or twenty five percent of the bank sales have now been to credit unions. It's terrifying. And but the pricing was like, you know, what they offered to what the Cohen banks would probably pay for is nearly fifty percent higher. So you can't blame them for one of the sales. So uh, I I don't. You can. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes, I mean the shareholders, you know. So I don't, I, I don't know what to say on that. But then again, you know, I, I kind of think you know the community bankers, you know, they need to quit starting banks to sell. Right. That's the issue. So it kind of like we screwed ourselves over the last twenty years of, with the community bankers. Oh, I want to you know raise capital and sell two times book. You now, how about you just raise capital and be a bank and be there for your community longer than ten years? You know, yep. so I, I think that was the heart of the issue. It wouldn't be happening, but you know, that, that's the big, big thing going on here in Florida with the bank selling the credit unions. Yeah. Yep. That's a big topic. I have complete faith. Eventually, the uh, you know the associations are going to solve this, and we're going to turn this thing around. You know, I mean, I, I'm not one of those people that don't you know I, I don't get it. No, I definitely get it. It's completely unfair, and it's totally wrong. Mm -hmm. Now get over that shit and move forward because it's not going anywhere. We haven't even won one battle yet. So I don't uh -huh. think we're going to change this one. But here's the cool part. When we look at, you know, this is a great example you just gave. You know, hey, I got a little bank here. Can't figure out how to make any money. Some fintech dude comes along by my bank. They double it up on whatever and they sell the bank. Okay, that's congratulations. We sold it to a credit union. Oh, it really gets me. But, look, look, you know, it's kind of the, what's the root of the problem? And you get back to it every time, and it's like, you know, I can't grow the bank, and I can't make any money. And you, of all people, know that that's not right. That, yeah, you can. You can do better. And what's frustrating is that you see sometimes in their technology stack that maybe they saved a dollar somewhere along the way, but, man, they handcuffed themselves to the, to the wall. There's nowhere to go here. That is correct. And they're just quite... Um which I don't understand is why they're not spending, you know, their own time investigating it. Like it doesn't take 15, 20 minutes on a lot of things, these things to test too, to okay. see. But um, yeah, the, yeah I, I think they're paying as much attention to the, the, that aspect of their business. They don't know that side of it. The community bankers are still very one-sided of, I make loans, I get deposits. Right. And, you know, they're working off a of NIM, which is a bad indicator because they're not looking at the cost of the deposits that it took to sales and everything else to get into it. You know, and, and at the end of the day, you know, you, you and I, we know that, you know, the big banks make money on processing and they can, too. They didn't have to be anything giant. So there's so many avenues that they can make safe money without, you know, giving away your charter to a fintech. You can eat. You can put much better parameters on all the yeah. paths. You know, the all the, even the good ones, I think, have, you know, like core limitations. And I'm not, I, I don't even like the word legacy core, but it just irritates me because if you got a better one, I'll take it. But nobody's got a better one. So mm -hmm. you know, that extra layer or intermediary or however we want to look at this or change your core to something that really fits your strategy, right? But at the end of it all, if you're getting your ass kicked, and you can't do anything about it. It's like, well, why don't we change our mobile? That's not going to do it. Anybody does the same stuff anyway. <laughs> and I had a guy tell me earlier today, we were talking and he's like, yeah, he said, you know, our IT people are making the decisions on our digital. I'm like, well, what could fucking go wrong there? Yeah, this is the worst people to have 
the decision makers, your IT, because there's no yeah. upside for success on them. All they look at is downside. Get you know, the people that are, in, you know, heading up over there, you know, the, the business side, consumer side, have them tagged into the incentivization of getting this process done correctly to grow the bank in the areas and hold them accountable for that. Then you can go in here and say, okay, maybe we ought to have them in the decision process yep. instead of left completely out of it to go, what the hell am I supposed to do about it? I'll give you guys a great one. So this is shit. 10 years ago, fairly early days of mobile, we had a bank mm -hmm. that was running our digital and uh, we went in and kind of, I don't want to say spied, but we basically went in through different departments of the bank to see if our training and everything was working. And we found that frontline staff and call center people, especially the older folks were dogging mobile, which was brand new. We just put it in. I mean, it was pretty good stuff, especially for the time. Best okay, of hang, on, hang on, hang on. You're and, saying that the customers would call on the phone. And the people at the bank were saying, yeah, we don't like mobile either. Just, just come on in. You're, I know you're right down the street. Just come on in. We'll get you fixed up, right? That kind of thing. Yeah. And <laughs> even some comments of things like, we don't really trust, you know, the internet, you know, that kind of yeah. stuff. <laughs> and it was like, we obviously horribly failed at our training. So we, you know, redid our training stuff. And what we ended up doing in the bank ended up doing was incentivizing those folks, right, directly and magically adoption and everything, you know, all of your scores, all of the ratings, everything went through the friggin' roof once you had your trusted frontline people on board, right? And getting them to use it was another thing, right? We That was one of the big ones, the eye-opener. Tons and tons of their own staff weren't even using the thing. And I'm like, oh, you haven't even downloaded your own mobile app, you know? Yep. Like, oh, shit. So there's a lot of little quick wins that are so easy, but we all overlook them. I always love the fact that, you know, over the years, bankers would call me like, Oh, what's your digital experience like? Just open up a damn account. <laughs> no <kidding. You> know? <laughs> yeah. Figure it out yourself. Like, I mean, that's what I wanted to do at a bank. If I wanted to see, you know, how good Chase is, I go open up a damn account at Chase and run through it. But, you know, none of I, I've yet to see many bankers even go do that. Yep. I We had uh, Pulse the other day on the show, and he was telling us that, what was it, Dad? Was it fi only 15% of banks or issuers have... Uh, mobile where you can add to a mobile wallet, add a card to a mobile wallet. Yeah, that kind of shocked me, right? Because obviously the big guys do. Yeah. I can see. Look, if I'm a small community bank, and and you know, let's say I'm in West Texas, hey, maybe that's not paramount today. Probably will be tomorrow, but okay, I can be a little bit behind. But for I think most people in most markets, I would have thought that that number would be a lot higher, right? I mean, yeah. you but know, you adding your, adding a digital wallet. Card, Digital card's kind of going to be a big deal, you know. You use it? Say, Ryan? I use mine. Yeah, I mean, I, I probably use my backup. You yeah, know, but I've got it in there a lot. Yeah. So I ended up uh, a little bit through COVID was kind of the exploration, you know, a little before that. But I ended up uh, <laughs> okay. So those who know me well know I have a history of running shit over with a tractor. I run over three cell phones with a tractor. Anyway, so I ran yeah. over my wallet. I ran over my wallet the other day. And uh, I went through the shredder, but it didn't get shredded. But I broke my my credit card, uh, and it screwed up the chip, yeah. right? So I can I can touch to pay, but it won't. You know, the little <laughs> ones won't work. And I'm like, shit. <laughs> I'm like, okay, but I got my mobile wallet. So now I find myself using my phone, paying everywhere. And I'm like, this is easy shit. You know, yeah. <laughs> cool. So that's your advice. We should all run over our wallets, and then we'll actually learn how to use shit. On the phone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. You, sometimes you gotta you gotta disrupt yourself. There you go. Innovation, disrupt yourself. That's perfect. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was a necessity. Is the mother of invention. And I, yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> what else uh, is going on, man? Yeah, I'm just you know kind of um, you know so excited. We're, you know, I'm always looking at creating um, stronger, stronger foundation for the bank and connectivity going forward. So. You know, I, I, I'm excited. We keep growing our departments and, um, you know, with longstanding good customers that are going to be lifelong. You know, we look for, you know, customers that are going to be here and, you know, we seek out customers as much as they seek us out. So that, that's been really exciting. That's sharp. Um, that was a really good call. It we, we think a lot. I mean, obviously, a lot of the vendor market and we work a lot with sales teams. And so our own sales team, I would say, is pretty rock star. Um, and we think about those things, right? I don't, I don't necessarily, you know, an inbound call. Now it's not a qualified opportunity, right? I, yeah. I would much rather 
be going after a relationship that I've done a ton of research, really know that I want these. And then I don't even care about the dollars in the relationship. I just want to get started with somebody and let it grow into what it should be. You know, that's a good way to do it. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, I mean, especially successful businesses, I mean, you're asking them change banking relationships, you know, typically only get it is, you know, during a loan, you may have an opportunity if you happen to be the biggest loan in their portfolio where you can, you know, or maybe you force their hands for one account, but you didn't really win the whole relationship. So, you know, getting out there now and seeking out, have an actual interest in what they do too, to begin with, I mean, in their industry and going through it. But, you know, there's so many ways that you can look at that, you know, uh, companies don't know that they're getting screwed over by big banks and fees and stuff. So, you know, you know, that's where we seek after the, the mid-level, you know, market We're we'll beat out, you know, the, the truest and everybody's in rates and volumes. I hope everybody heard what he just said. Cause I, I, I think that way too. I, I, I see this, that every company, every, everything in the whole industry is about how do we make more? How do we make more money? Nobody ever talks about how do I spend less? And for you yeah. being able to say, Hey man, I can take a business and show him that I can save him. We well, can save a lot on your muffler, right? So you get, you know, or your, what is it? 15% of your car insurance, right? <laughs> or, are there cool things that I can do for you as a bank that will lower your, your costs? Are there things that I can do? to not 5% off of what you're spending right now in your card process or whatever, right? And neat little things that bankers can do. They know if they think of it, but we always think the other way. How do I make more money? How do I make him more money? Or I'm trying to greed my way forward rather than sometimes it's a better idea to just focus on how I can help this guy not spend as much and do a better thing for the, you know, same cost or less at a higher level of service, right? And we're in that environment, right? We're not in a innovate build super expensive cool stuff and that's going to bring you customers we're in a save the guy five bucks and you might win it right everybody's kind of tightening up right now but that, let me ask this right so i was thinking about this the other day to your point of you know the average business consumer whoever they don't really they don't know that they're getting screwed by the big banks they don't know credit unions are dumb right they don't know fintechs yeah. are screwing everything up whatever right and I kind of asked myself, you know, just first principles, like at re-asking myself that question the other day, I'm like, why the hell don't, don't everybody get it? And I got to thinking that we had a pretty good bump there through COVID, especially with the business side. PPP, right? yeah, we were I all mean, here. PPP showed up, right? And I think that this synapse evolve thing, hopefully to a certain extent, is kind of pushing the fintech guys back a little bit. Like, ooh, I didn't know if Chime went down, I lose all my money, right? Like, Right? Yeah. So maybe there's some positive in some of that. We just need to hit on the credit unions and we'll, we'll yeah. have the trifecta. I mean, I think so too, because, you know, I, I don't know, why, why would you want to go work? I mean, we've all seen it. When I graduated college, it was the at the end of the dot-com blow up. There was no financial jobs available then. And so, you know, every bit of rise, you know, there's going to be some fantastic fintechs, but for the most part, it's going to fade away. They are 100% dependent on the bank. Mm -hmm. So who's going to win. And it just pissed me off. Like you got a valuation and you lose money. And, uh, you know, I swear if we correlate the amount of swag that the companies were buying, you know, early on, you probably see their percentage of demise faster, but it, you know, they, they didn't make any money. Like it, there was no, so, but there's a lot of people that so many good people that went to go work, a lot of fintechs that are fantastic that should be in banking. It, you right. know, it is you can do the same thing in banking. Yeah. And that's where I look at like it's kind of like I always want to know my you, you got to your bank's responsibility, you have to know the customer's customer. And that's hard when you're doing a bass and you're having a uh, a synapse and you know there's no way you can have an intermediary that's controlling things and you're just beholden to accepting files that you have really no way of knowing if they're on a sanctions list or you know, they have no no idea. You know, I, I guarantee you, you took take the level if you take the level of SARS that we file and proportionate to the transactions we do, you'll see that those banks are completely have probably haven't filed shit. Right. Yeah. So we would just blow them away. They would probably be have to have filed you know ten thousand SARS a month to keep up at our level of due diligence that we do here. Uh, yeah. Probably even a hundred thousand at that level because there's just trillions of dollars going through that they have no idea, 
who owned it, who was switching back and forth. That's the crux of it. So, I mean, there should be giant AML, etc. But, you know, get close down to the line. Like, how are these existing? How are they even making money if they were just making, oh, they're a bill pay provider, they're paying bills. Are you kidding me? A bank can do that cheaper and better. So take them out and you provide that service. Like a bank can have their own bill pay provider. Like, so I always look down that line. I bank, uh, you know, MSBs across the nation. I love that industry. They are entrepreneurs. They have had to, when I say MSBs, for the most part, check cashers. That's a roof because there's a lot of, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I like them. The the business owners, they're entrepreneurs. They usually have multi entrepreneurs. They're actually providing a service to the unbanked and underbanked and are in there and get shit on day in, day out. But they're still there helping. They're great people. There's only so much percentage to be made on a personal, let's say 2%. So that's 2% for them to make and the bank to make. So it's always who's getting a piece of that 2% and who exactly has the risk. You know, that check cashier has a risk because they're putting their money up first and then the, the bank has a risk. So we have the two people that have a risk up too. So we should be making the most that percentage. And then you take in whatever little slice of data, middleware, and any in between how many networks, find yourself all the way down there to take that because you already have that risk of that dollar amount. So just keep eating at all of those costs and see because I can tell you the bank can do it. We have a compliance. We have the bookkeeping. We know all that stuff. Just keep, you know, enhancing and get further down the load and close to your customer. So then we have a competitive advantage because we provide all that. We have it cheaper and they can still stay in business and be there tomorrow. So that just, but there's so many different industries that, you know, banks can be involved in. It doesn't have to be, you know, something gargantuan that's going to hit every customer. I mean, it can be an industry that, you know, has 10,000 companies or 500, you know, it doesn't have to be. And there's a way to quantify risk and run through each scenario if you just, you know, Mm -hmm. Take your time and walk through it and use some comments. Yeah, this, this is perfect. It's exactly what we kind of touched on earlier that, you know, uh, if I just have to extend what I have, I, I, there's a lot of things I can do. But if as I was able to offer, let's say, fintech feature products, right? Mm -hmm. And it'll talk with uh, Wade Arnold about that, that, you know, it's it's the lack of flexibility to bring products to market because my core doesn't offer, my mobile vendor doesn't offer it. And it's like, Okay, I'd like to have a credit builder, two French fries, and large coke, or mm -hmm. I'd like to add a earned wage, or you know whatever. We don't even get these products yet. There's a zillion vendors doing it. Uh, for you know, there's so much demand in the fintech world. There's 25 vendors doing each one of these things, right? They there's buy, always, they all this there's always way to work with whatever core you're on and their constraints. You just have to know the rules of the game that you're currently under because. You know, I've been under several cores and I've been able to make it in every single one. You know, there may be one that is going to charge you a per item on something that, you know, let's say it's remote deposit capture and they won't take out 25 cents. Well, then you just don't do that product during, while you're under that core. There's always something else to do, though, too. This is great. You know, until you're out of it. Like, OK, great. We can't make money in that one. Then take it out of your fucking mind and go to the next one. You I know? swear, we were talking about this like an hour ago, me and Tanner. So about the. What, what do we call it, Tanner? The, the wine fest, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's always just a big bitch fest when you talk to bankers about, oh, I can't do that or my core that. And it's like, and you're the opposite. You're you're the the solve the problem kind of guy. And it's like, okay, let's let's put together what we need to actually solve the problem and try to go look at it. rather than just complain about it, complain about it, complain yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. Or talk to people that can help you. And it's like, I got an well, idea. We'll hire a giant consulting company. Well, that's probably what oh. Always a mess. To, to your point, <laughs> think about the on the core side. I think I, I tell bankers all the time. I'm like, they're looking for you, man. Like you're a hot commodity, not because of some bill or invoice to be paid. If you're trying to do clever shit, they want customers that are pushing them, so they're building cool stuff. And then you can be out there saying how freaking great they are, yeah. and y'all can all make the cover of some magazine together, right? Like. And to your point, Ryan, you always stay at the senior levels of your partners. And I, I think most bankers, they get yeah. they get tucked in with their relationship manager, and that's the extent of the relationship, right? You need to be up above that. Yeah, anything you can. But, I mean, it doesn't matter, all of them. I think if you have an actual, you know, let, let's say they come to you and say, oh, my, you know, SOW is going to be, I don't know, 
50,000, you want to do a tiny little test, you know, there's ways down, you know, maybe you come to them and say, okay, I'll cover that over time, but we'll pay you incrementally as we grow. You know, I mean, there are things that you could do if you were dead set on that arena, but you know, they all accept files and transactions. So you don't necessarily have to have an API either. They're already, our protocols, they, you're sending files all day long at your core. So you can, you know, I mean, there's a lot of ways, you know, the skin of cat. I mean, so there's just many ways that you can still grow your bank uh, if, you're, if you're in confines and then you move, but then you have to know your bank. I get, I'm, conversions are a, a good thing for so many reasons. But I think the number one reason is, is it's forcing you to take a look at your business and to look at each thing. So, you know, I, uh, I, you know, during conversions, even though I'm not the expert in that, just listening, hearing your staff, hearing back and forth, you know, and decisions that either they're making a little level, you, you know, you, you just know the bank so much better and you know where your items are. I mean, there's a reason why cores ask you for certain level of data ahead of time when they're going to, when you're start courting, I mean, because they know it costs them money. You need to know what costs you money, you know, but the banks, you know, don't, they they don't go into it that way or know their business and say, yes, we're really going to grow this line. And this particular line is going to be ACHs. So we need to focus highly on, you know, automating ACHs and reconciling or monitoring controls, you know, that. You that, know? that is such a good perspective. The uh, conversion is more like uh, you're you're shedding your skin and now you're a healthier faster snake man i love that that's a yep. really good that going through a conversion process it gets you to take a look at things internally and you know level up your operation yeah I mean, I mean you got to think of how many bankers throughout the years you talk to and the the ones that are really good you know a lot of times you know that was a pivotal event in their banking life was conversions you know the ones that are, you know, all upset about it, you know, maybe those aren't the ones that you want to hire in an interview and hire the ones that were excited about it because, yeah. you know, they changed because it, it doesn't matter where you go. There's, you know, that time frames between you switch, you've probably changed some of your process, some for the better and some for the worse. And you, maybe you forgot or you forgot that you made a decision said, you know, that's an acceptable right now. We will do that manually because it only takes us, you know, 30 seconds over the a week, but heck now that built up to three hours a day right? Exactly. Exactly. years later. And so those are the things you, you know, I look at and things, I mean, right. j just the time when we increased our volume, then you have time of, Oh, now I got to manage RDIs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, so we were hanging out this weekend talking about you. I swear to God, true story. And, uh, <laughs> and we, we decided not only we're going to have you like give them the roundup, do all kinds of stuff. We pretty much want you to take over. And uh, no, no way. Yeah, man. No, I'm kidding. We want we want people like you that other bankers can come and say, you know, give me an example. I'll, I'll tell you a cool one. When you told your story, that's what me and him were talking about. Was that I didn't know half of your story. I didn't know what you had walked into. You know, mm -hmm. I knew where you were, but I didn't oh, know yeah. how the hell you got there. And when I heard how you got there, I'm like. I mean, this guy's literally like taking a flamethrower in the face. I mean, he's incredible. And what he turned that into would just work the problem, determination, thinking man, uh, really, really worked his way through this thing. And so, man, I tell you what, I was, anyway, we had a lot of fun talking about you this weekend. Uh, we need to have guys like that get out here and talk with other bankers and have him come to the roundup and make him more available to people. Yeah, what, what I'd like to do, man, I want you to at least like moderate a panel or something like that. And I want to make a change this year. I want bankers to moderate or drive the conversations, right? Look at it this way. Think about the panel we did last year where we had, I think it was you and a few other bankers, but we had, I don't know, one of us moderated the panel, right? Uh -huh. it, it should be almost the other way, right? We should have the vendors on the panel and the banker moderating and asking the hard questions. And you will ask people the hard questions, you know? So yeah, that's... Not I want bigger driving the conversation. Yeah, I mean the biggest thing, guys, and you guys are are very rare because you know you act like practitioners, so you guys know the substance in the back end so well, and that's where and I had a great time at the fintech last week because you actually had practitioners of their trade there. You know when you go around to 
it's not so much the association, but the other bank related stuff, you know, I'll only maybe you'll fool me once. I'm not going back twice. <laughs> it is the I shittiest and most hollow stuff. I have gotten no help in banking from the, 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 you know, no. the bank director, you know, and it's like, and then the, the interviews they do and the people it, it's like, okay, well, clearly I see you paid the advertising. Like, I mean, it just, Man, I was going to say the same thing. I go to a breakout session and the educational speaker is a salesman. And I'm like, yeah, this- how is that going to help me? Yeah. You don't know this. And this is what they've done in, in the model. And I'm not picking on anybody. I mean, everybody. Well, every industry whatever. does that too, though. Yeah. They'll, you know, when you you put on a conference and you're, you know, state of whatever, right? Or ICB, ABA, what about what ABA, what? And you've got vendor people that pay the bill so that you can actually do this. And so they want to pay to be a speaker or pay to be on a panel or whatever it is that you want to hurt. They end up having a moderator that's not even a banker or maybe a reformed banker at best talking to vendor type people or pontificators. And all the people in the audience of the bankers are going, like you said, kind of heard this before. I can tell who's paying the bills, right? I'm not really getting to the heart of how do I fix anything or what can I do about it? Or let me tell you my story and what we went through and how we came out the other side in a super profitable way. And so what Tanner's saying is that I think as much as we get out of the room, we even want to get more, more out of the room and mm-hmm. let bankers lead panels of other bankers, let bankers lead topics, not have people talk to bankers, have right. bankers talk to people. To flip it upside and down. And ask questions down. and ask questions of each other. So what Ryan said, it's usually it's you have your your senior level bankers go listen to junior level vendors. And what we've tried to do, <laughs> I want I try and get the I get the senior level vendors to sponsor the whole thing. And so we get to hang out with the smart innovator pros, right? Yes. That all the cool stuff for us. And then from the banker side, we can all hang out and have real conversations, right? And it it brings a different dynamic, but it's hard to pull off, right? It's got to be something that is different and it's it's every year it's a it's a challenge because you got to hold that line man there's i would love to make something bigger or have more people but you just can't you got to keep yeah. the line together and keep it intimate so that it's quality and i get it too but I feel like most of people don't under understand you know it's like okay the ones that you know usually are the top spot pays you know, I mean, that's professional speaker. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, yeah, we got Davy Crockett and you know Roger Staubach. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I, I I like that a lot, and, and I like that you had more because a lot of the association of the banker side, you'll have, you know, the, on the community bank, you'll have the lender side, um, and a lot of CEOs have come straight from the lending side. So you, it's that sales driven aspect. And they don't know how to run the rest of their balance sheet. You know, they they don't know their call report. They don't know the whole other leverage. And so it, it was good that you actually had, you know, that badass controller at an institution that is just good at what they're doing. And, you know, somebody that's fantastic at, you know, debit card presentments, because that's a whole that's an art form going through there. You got to stay on top of that. And, you know, what best practices for banks? I mean, yeah. You know, every couple of years you end up like, my God, we forgot how to, you know, pick up the the pulling guard. I mean, it's like, this is basic stuff, guys. And, mm-hmm. and we're now kind of getting to that point where maybe we need to have a conversation about liquidity and asset liability management. Let's go back to the drawing board because we see so many bankers making really fundamental mistakes. We're all trying to have the conversation about innovation and how to make more money and be more profitable yeah. so you don't have to spend your bank. And I think some of these guys are, man, they got left in the locker and he's still looking for his helmet. But that goes back to, you know, if if the if you've got the same company doing your AOM model, but the same one, you know, presenting to you bond swap and they're selling and buying from their own portfolio of other banks. Ooh. You're an idiot. Like you got to exactly. have separate like, no, I'm trust but verify. I like you, but all day long, I'm going to get the best price and what's going to be the best for the bank at this specific time, you know, not, not all of that kind. You got to have separation with these things. And so just to that point, like how, how do they not have separation? Where do they lose that? Like, are you looking forward to any of the, you know, rate cuts? Is that going to be a good thing for you guys in Florida? I, um, you know, the way, 
I mean, part of me wants a little rate cut, but the other part is at least now it's incentivizing people to save and pay down their, their payments because I'm was I was a horrible residential lender because they're like, you know, people, what's the most I can afford? No, don't get the most you can afford. You know, you're never going to be able to maintain that house if you do that, you know. Um, so I like the rates being where people can make 4% risk free, four and a quarter in a money market. You know, what's wrong with that for people? You know, so we've conditioned everybody the last 20 years to be acceptable, you know, with the Consumer Protection Bureau, you know, think that buy near a later actually helps the downtrodden. You know, uh, uh, like uh, no, uh, what I helps the downtrodden guy. is fucking proven that yes, you can if you pay down your mortgage faster, that's less you pay in interest. You know, you need to have a risk and a reward. You know, you got to have that. So yeah, if it wants to go down a quarter, half a point. You know, going to equalize the you know the banks and their AOCI, but you know what? I don't give a shit about AOCI because I got a ton of liquidity and I didn't plan on that. So my mm -hmm. AOCI can go up and down all at once. I'm still strong and it's still going to maintain capital over ten percent regardless. So, yeah, hey man, we've talked a lot about America. I, the rates need to stay so people can actually save and not be going down that route. So that's a good point. You know, I don't give a shit if the rates. It's a good point until you go buy a new truck and it's like, hold it. Hold yeah. Well, well the, you know, well, who was the first at dealer rebates? You know, I mean, they they were smart in the 70s, 80s. They figured that out. You know, the auto manufacturers are going to figure that out too. Yeah. But, well, you, uh, you hear it perfect, though. If you, if you went down, you know, 50 basis points, it's going to get the, you know, it's like pouring the water over the ice. It's going to get things moving again, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't have to be tremendous, but to free unfreeze the real estate market just a little bit, right? Uh, be able to get rates down just enough where people actually can't afford to get that yeah. new truck. Now we're manufacturing. That's the part that pisses me off is the new people, the new graduates can't afford a house and how that discrepancy happened. But, you know, when, when did, you know, the house prices increase to a median income? They started skyrocketing in the 70s with the invention of the 30 year fixed mortgage. So it'll keep going. When we keep going that low rate cycle and then, oh, we want to get stimulus. Then what's next? 50-year mortgage, 40-year, you know, zero down. That's just a mess. I, I don't know if it's true, but I heard like half of the people in the UK are on interest-only loans, half of the homeowners. So are you kidding me? Like, no. I mean, I want my damn freedom. The goal is pay off a freaking house so you're, you know, only beholden to your property taxes and insurance. You know, what happened to, you know... To Not a creative real estate Yeah. So, I, you know, yeah, I, I, I don't want... It's a huge shock it's for commercial, you know, notes that are resetting from five years ago. So they went up too fast, too quick. But, you know, we need to maintain at a level, you know. So, I mean, I've never seen anybody get rich off the of time value of money. Have you? I mean, they taught me that in school 30 years ago. But, you know, now we're like, oh, you make money off your money? You know, mm. now the kids are like, yeah, oh, they're rich buying, <laughs> buying video, right? Yeah. Uh, that's how we do it. There you yeah. go. Yeah. I love it. Everything, not so much. Yep. Yep. Awesome.